Well, things have gotten hotter in the wrestling war, Brian. Shots have been fired. People are leaping. We're getting jumps again. Is this going to be a, a, a the harbinger of things to come? All the talent jumping back and forth? Or do you think this is a one-way jump? I don't know. Obviously, you're talking about Paul White, formerly known as The Big Show. <laughs> Never to be known as The Big Show again. That's right. Because it's trademarked by the WWE. Jumping to AEW, something that not a lot of people expected. And there are similarities and differences to the jumps that happened in the 90s between WWF and WCW. We'll talk about that. But I don't know. I mean, this is a situation where he was clearly offered more than Vince McMahon was willing to pay him at this stage in his career. And he took it. Can't blame him for that. No. But I don't know what that says about other situations. Randy Orton stayed with the WWF and signed a long-term, I think, five-year contract because he got a better deal and he wanted to stay there. So when it comes to guys that are in the middle of their careers, I don't know. You know, when the jumps happened in the 90s, right? the first batch of jumps to WCW, Hogan, Savage, to an extent Gene Okerlund and Bobby Heenan, but really Hogan and Savage, we look at them, we think, oh, they were at the end of their career, they were older, or they were younger than the big show is now. Yeah. And then the next batch, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were well younger and in the middle of their careers. So it is a little different. That's the big question. Are there going to be guys that jump who are in the middle of their careers and are stars? Moxley fit that criteria. Big show, not to take anything away from him, but he doesn't really fit that. He's not like a hot wrestler of the moment. He's more of a wrestling star of the past generation. He's a, he, he's a big name. He's a big name, and what Tony Khan bought was a bunch of publicity. And I'm I'm not going to knock show. I've known show for 25 years or whatever, and he's been wonderful. Um, he's he's uh, once again just the due to the fact of the generation that he comes from, and that there were so many more people watching wrestling at that time than there are now. He's a bigger mainstream recognized name than almost anybody today. Now, the, the problem is that I can, I can pretty much tell you how he got away from the WWE because this has been Vince's Achilles heel, soft spot, weak spot, blind spot, whatever. When, he, when Hogan jumped, when Savage jumped, in this instance now, in, in a number of them, Vince starts thinking that somebody's over the hill, past their prime, too old, need to be moved down, somebody needs to come up and take their place, whatever, without bothering to make sure that the talent that he's trying to move out is in, on the same page. That's the same reason that Savage left. I, I was the one that filled in for Savage doing a, a color on Raw when Savage left with no notice. And we were. Where was it the night we found out we were that goddamn we were in the Poconos doing a raw taping at one of the resorts up there that had the heart-shaped jacuzzi tubs in the rooms. But I'm I'm in the Poconos by myself having just done raw. No room service, the restaurant closes at nine o'clock up there, and I'm in a fucking hotel room all by myself with a heart-shaped jacuzzi. That was a fun night. But Savage left because it was like, fuck, I don't want to retire. I'm not ready to be done, etc. With Hogan, it was the same thing. He wanted to move Hogan down. He thought Hogan's time had come. And Hogan said, I can get a bunch more money from these suckers down here, which is kind of another thing that Big Show probably said, because you know he just called Jericho. Said, hey, how much will this fucking Mark offer me? Vince probably and the WWE made an offer to Big Show, I'm sure, that they felt was good for them, but not for Big Show. They were, I'm sure Vince was probably thinking, well, it's been 20 years. Paul will want to stay here. We'll make him an ambassador. We'll sign him to a moderate contract where he can make appearances or whatever, but his wrestling days are done, maybe except for a special occasion. And they made him a financial offer, I'm sure, that, reflected that standpoint 
And Big Show looks at it and goes, well, I could do that. Or since I'm pretty much done with wrestling anyway, because he's, he's 50 and he knows it. He's had injuries. It's not like he's going to wrestle for even five more years or anything on a full-time basis. He hasn't been doing that for some time. But he has to look at that offer and say, well, if I'm done with fucking wrestling, why don't I just cash in and get a big fucking deal from the billionaire down there? Because he knows very well that in two years, Vince would take him back, put him in the Hall of Fame or whatever, because this is not going to be a a business changing move. It's going to, it's going to get AEW a lot of publicity. And we'll talk in a minute about how they might can use him, but it's going to get AEW a lot of publicity. It's not going to hurt WWE's business. One iota. Vince even said to me in the midnight express, we've talked to him in 86 and I've heard him say this to other guys or heard him heard other guys say, he said this to him. If you don't want to take my offer, pal, use my offer against Jim Crockett or whoever to, to get more money. Because Vince always says that, if especially if he thinks that it, he's not going to get the guy, because then he knows, well, it, I'll re, he'll remember that I said that, and he'll remember maybe if he does use it to get more money than when I want him in the future. Vince is always thinking ahead. It's not just now or never, do or die with him. He knows he'll make an impression and get you sometime. So the point is, <clears throat> WWE probably made an offer to show based on him being a 50-year-old almost retired former wrestling star. Whereas Tony Khan was willing to open up a checkbook to get a big major mainstream wrestling name and get a lot of publicity and a lot of attention over it. It's not going to hurt WWE's business one iota. That show is not there because he's barely been there to begin with for the past few years. And now we come to the part where is it going to help AEW's business and in what kind of intangible way because it even if there was a box office it's not going to help that big show being on an AEW event is not going to sell any more tickets probably than they were going to anyway because <clears throat> unfortunately one of the catch 22s is with this new younger hipper we like wrestling cuz it's silly and funny audience that votes for my little dog pockets and the young dick watchers and uh, whatever, and all the awards big shows, not cool to them. So do you think I he's a bigger star than Jericho to the casual fan? Probably, probably because he was used in a, a higher position in the real attitude era in the last days, of the attitude era than Jericho was when he came in right on the, on the end of it. He's been in major television programs, you know, as a, a, just that picture of him, the, the, the sight of him because of the world's largest athlete, whatever stands out. You probably, yes. It is a little reminiscent of when he first appeared in the WWF or WWE because he debuts in that cage match and the announcer. So like, it's Paul white, it's Paul white. <laughs> and everyone's saying who? Because they couldn't say it was the Giant. Yeah. And now we're back at that point. They can't call him the Big Show. They can't call him the Giant. So he's just Paul White again. And therein lies one of these problems. And that's what Vince designed when he wants to copyright everybody's name is you can't go and use the name that you're known by worldwide for somebody else. So unless they see the picture combined with the name, or unless they're a real hardcore fan that knows that that uh, Big Show's real name is Paul White, there's a an obstacle. But he, Tony Khan jumped at the chance to buy some publicity, and that's what he got. And the the but the audience that he's targeting was already there. They already know that the Big Show's name is Paul White, and they're all uh, you know fucking freaking out about it. The people who don't really watch his program probably still don't know that the big show is going to show up on that program because they don't know who Paul White is and they ain't watching that program. Here's the problem. They painted themselves into a corner. If, <sighs> WWE made a, a deal to Paul White based on what he was worth to them. And, and that wasn't suitable to Paul. And that's his choice. But Tony Khan paid him a bunch of money. Can he get it back and how can he get it back? They've already announced that 
Paul and Tony Schiavone will be the announce team on a YouTube show. Well, an announcer, he uh, shows well-spoken, he's intelligent, he probably can announce, but is that the thing that you would first have in the top of your mind when, oh, the big show's coming to AEW, he's going to be an announcer. He's never done that before in his life. What about the visual? What about the visual of him even sitting at an announce desk next to, and we know the AEW talent is on the smaller side of any talent in any wrestling company in the world. So, going to be like Sting. He's going to have to contribute in other ways because he's not going to wrestle every week on television or even, you know, every pay-per-view probably, as he's been part-time for some time. So, can he agent? Can he be a producer? Well, probably he's got plenty of experience, but... Even though, I mean, they've got a bunch of people with experience there. Jim Ross, Jake Snake Roberts, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard. It doesn't seem like they're listening to any of them. So what can Big Show tell Felix to improve his game that Felix is going to listen to? Or Pockets? Or Dwarf Dong Sucker? What about a manager? Jake's a manager. Tully's a manager. Arn's a manager. Can you see that visual? Here's the Big Show. He's managing. Fucking who? Who would he not make look like a an idiot and a small child standing next to him? Well, again, they announced that he's coming in to be a commentator on their new YouTube show. And the way they put it, I think, was that he's been licensed to wrestle. Which you got to think will be every now and then for a special occasion, but... Okay, who? Here's, a, here's another corner that Tony Khan's painted in, himself into with his talent roster of, of grade schoolers. He's bought publicity in Big Show. He has, he has signed a, one of the biggest available wrestling names currently living to a contract to work for him. What the fuck can he do? It, when Vince McMahon signed Big Show, he had Kane, he had Undertaker, he had Mark Henry, he had Stone Cold Steve Austin, Triple H, The Rock, Mick Foley, on and on. Who on the AEW roster could you match the Big Show with to forget about even a, a visually believable to even draw any money? And especially knowing the Big Show will be a huge baby face. Because he's just signed and they always love stars when they come in. So look at the roster. Brian, you got an AEW talent roster in front of you, don't you? I don't. Can you find one? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I know who works there. Okay, let's 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 show. let's go down let's go down the list. Let's go down the list. John Moxley versus Big Show. Fucking they'll probably do that at some point, but good lord. Um, I would love, I would love to see a finish meeting between Big Show and, and Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang. So Olivier and Big Show, no. Team Taz, Cage, maybe Starks, probably not. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my notes from the TV show. Obviously, Sting versus Big Show. Well, we don't want to do that, do we? For a variety of reasons. Darby Allen versus Big Show. Santana and Ortiz could be Gordman and Goliath. And Big Show could be Andre. They're going to put him in a tag match with someone smaller. Adam Page? Cody? That's... Uh, I come back to that Cody versus Big Show is the one match that they could probably have and work and not be an offensive clusterfuck because both those guys know what they're doing. But then Cody's uh, the closest thing to a baby face they have, even though he's got a bitchy wife that throws water on basketball legends. Lance Archer but it just took him 20 minutes to beat a guy that's a foot shorter and 100 pounds fucking lighter. You know what would happen in that Lance Archer-Paul White match? He would grab Paul White by the arm and climb up the ropes, and then he would walk across the ropes to the middle of the ring and do a backflip. 
Because he does that in every match now. I bet you he would. And if, and if, at, at one point of uh, the old big show, he might have just walked out from under him. But, um, but he, you know, if I can ask you another way of looking at this, you said that Tony Khan did this for the publicity, and he got a lot of publicity for it. They announced on Twitter that Paul White is all elite. And everyone said, oh, my God, you know, we didn't even notice that he wasn't there anymore. Like, no one, you know, it was a weird reaction from a lot of people. And a lot of the hardcore AEW fans aren't very happy about this. But let's take that out of the equation for now. They announce on Twitter that he's joined the company. Tony Khan puts out a statement that he's going to be a commentator on the new second YouTube show, as well as occasionally wrestle. And then there was some kind of quote that, you know, Paul White agreed that this is the best wrestling company in the world. There was some kind of <laughs> fluff statement there. And then... Not to spoil the review, they kind of had a little image of him on the screen at one point, at the bottom, in the bottom left corner, I think, saying that he's going to be doing something on YouTube in a few weeks. Wouldn't they have gotten more publicity if they waited a week until it was a live dynamite and just had him walk out? And have him walk out and, and people across the country be shocked on television. Right. You would have gotten more publicity because everyone would be on Twitter. Oh, my God, the big show's there, good or bad. He's there. He's, well, that, what's going on? That would have been a way to do it, but then you'd have to have some type of self-restraint and control over yourself instead of just being proud of every time you buy a shiny new bauble, you got to crow about it. I said it before. It's like the kid in the movie, The Toy. You know, he goes into the toy store. He sees Richard Pryor as the janitor. He says, I want him. <laughs> I want that. I want that man to come live with me and... Jackie Gleason. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the problem. And, and, you know, once again, I'm glad for show that he's getting getting a big contract. Well, not that he hadn't had a big contract before, but he's getting this big contract from this guy. Um, But what in the world and what in the world can he do there? And that's not saying that he's talentless and can't do anything. What can he do in this environment? In this environment that they've built where everything's silly and it's a bunch of gymnasts and there's no credibility and nobody's going to, nothing makes sense. And now we've got the big show as an announcer. And that's the- On YouTube, on the second on YouTube. YouTube show. Yeah. And and you asked, is this going to start jumping back and forth? No. The answer is the reason why Randy Orton stayed with Vince because he still wants to work. I'm sure at least five more years and possibly on and off after that for that amount of money and call his own schedule. And he knows that the WWE is going to be there and in position to pay him and push him. And it's the biggest company and he's not done with his career. Big shows like, okay, if I, this is the last thing I ever fucking need a year or two of this and I'm fucking, I was going to be done anyway. So it's gravy for him, but so like you said, Vince, they're going to have to be careful for the next couple of years till whenever happens, happens with this company. Um, they're going to have to be careful that they're guys that are aging out, that they don't really want to re-sign for any major amount of money or give a top push to. They're going to have to be careful how they talk to them, you know, and, and maybe give them a little bit extra to stick around. But then again, they may not care because, as I mentioned, it's not like it was in WCW where it's they're neck and neck and, and somebody could pull ahead at any minute. I wouldn't be surprised if Vince didn't fucking, well, fine, let Paul take the guy's money. What's he going to do down there? Because they see it's not going to affect their business. Yeah, and once you start signing guys who are not in the middle of their career but have a name that they can't even use off that TV, you got to be careful. Before you know it, you turn into TNA. Well, exactly. And, and there's the situation is that the majority of the names that the average wrestling fan knows are over the hill and outside the ring positions in AEW, and and they're having to stand around and watch these goofs do whatever the fuck it is they call wrestling, and it it doesn't it doesn't attract the viewers that know those legends because they want to see wrestling, and apparently it doesn't fucking impress the people who vote for these Cirque de Boucher awards and the observer for the legends to be there because they vote for all the people that these legends wouldn't have spit on in their fucking active days and would have laughed at. 
so he's just he's collecting people to put in this thing. It's like having a a million pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, but it's five or six different puzzles. You got all these pieces, but it doesn't make one coherent picture. It anyway. That's the thing. I don't think there's going to be any jumping back and forth. I don't think that the WWE is going to take anyone from AEW, not only because they wouldn't want them, most of, the, most of them, but because they don't want to set a precedent that you can work for them and then come work for us. And they've done that with other companies in the past on an unofficial basis, and they'll do it here. Um, and I don't think that anybody in their active career, unless they're either so low on the totem pole that they just want any kind of a break, or unless they're the occasional, apparently goof like this Moxley is, that this is the kind of wrestling he's wanted to do all along. And now he gets to do it, and good for you. And I'm sure they were happy to see you fucking go from the other place if you were constantly bringing up thumbtacks and exploding barbed wire. Uh, there's not going to be any fucking major going back and forth. This is, it is what it is. And they they have bought a wonderful fucking designer custom made vehicle that they have no idea how to drive and don't have a road that will support it. And they can't use its name and they can't call it by its name. Hey, one other question for you. Obviously, if you are a WWE guy who wants a cozy lifestyle and you live in Florida, AEW is a perfect place for you to end up. You'll get a nice payday. Yeah. You have a boss who really wants to be your friend. Show already does live in Florida. Exactly. Yep. And you work at most two nights every two weeks. <laughs> After the pandemic, maybe it'll go back to once a week. But they were not looking at house shows. They were not doing house shows. It's a really easy schedule. It's a comfortable life if you live in Florida. With that said, Tony Khan, because he's living off his dad's money, has unlimited capital because his father is a billionaire. He has money to throw around. They have not been able to break away and expand their audience at all. No disrespect to the former Big Show, but I don't think he's someone who's going to, especially as a commentator on YouTube, he's someone who's going to do much to expand their audience. Maybe it could have done a little bit more if you had him just show up on the show, like Medusa with the belt, just to surprise everyone, to shock everyone. Yeah, and this was a taped show from the previous week. Yeah, so they could they could have just held him till next week, had him walk out live, and with Shaq and on he the would show, have been in the same building with Shaq, it would have been perfect. But anyway, Tony Khan has all this money; he needs to do something to make things pop in some way, and it's a cozy, cozy lifestyle. How much money would he throw at John Cena, and would John Cena ever consider it? No, I, I don't. He's on TBS. He's hosting a show on TBS. I keep seeing commercials for. Yeah, but think about this. Cena is such upper stratosphere apart from above big shows pay grade. Almost everybody but Hogan, Austin Rock. You would need to be the son of a billionaire to be able well, to afford him. But what I'm saying is Vince has his catalog. Vince has all the matches. Vince has his history. He's working in Hollywood. He's doing regular television. But if he wanted to have anything to do with a wrestling company for money or anything else, he would stick with Vince because you can still exploit all that stuff that his whole career has been with Vince. And I, I, and I just don't see him. He doesn't need the money. I don't see him taking a step backwards. Hi, John. This is Tony Khan. Hold on. Let me put down my white claw. This is Tony Khan. <laughs> I'll offer you more than Vince. I'll let you keep your merch. I'll let you do any outside projects you want, but you have to wrestle four matches a year for me and do <laughs> promos. It's kind of like Hogan going to WCW. Well, on paper, it's like, wow, they're really throwing a lot of money at Hogan and he's not even like peak Hogan right now, although he would have a renaissance in a sense, but it kind of opened the door for WCW to a lot of people. If it's Cena, and you have nothing but money, I mean, it's your dad's money, but you have nothing but your dad's money, and you have the ability to be creative with what kind of deal you offer him, why not throw a shit ton of money at him? Maybe you could even get TNT to pick up a little bit of it if you can get them to book him for some more stuff. He's doing something on TBS. Let him keep his merch. You keep 100% of your merch. 
Well, they, they almost did that with Hogan and WCW. They lost money every time they sold a Hogan T-shirt. Yeah, and then it got to the point, actually, where there were stories where people would go and buy, like, a Ric Flair action figure, and when they would see the scan at KB Toys, it would say Hulk Hogan. Yeah. So he was getting credit <laughs> for stuff that wasn't even his. But, listen, you have the ability to make a really creative deal for Cena and only use him a few times a year and just have him shoot promos in Hollywood or whatever and send them in. I don't know. Would he consider that? He, Vince owns the catalog. Vince doesn't own the name. I don't know. I don't know about that. Those are the two big ones out there, Cena and CM Punk. I mean, The Rock, but I don't think The Rock is a... I think The Rock will probably put an investment group together and buy WWE more than he will show up. I'm glad you... I thought you were going to say buy AEW. I was going to say he's got more business sense than that. Um, But, and once again, this is no disrespect to Big Show. If it was 20 years ago, this would be phenomenal because he would be just starting his career. And it, well, I've told you a story. I almost got him first before WCW. And as soon as you saw the guy that you were like, holy shit, this is money. Yeah, he was at Dennis Carluzzo's convention for the NWA tournament, November 19th, 1994. I took a picture of him there. Yes, he was there because Larry Sharp brought him to meet me. Now, yeah, Hildebrand told me, he goes, go take a picture of that guy. He's going to be a star. And I went up to him. He was just some giant guy. He was skinny, walking yeah. around. I took a picture of him that day. He wasn't very happy. He didn't seem very <laughs> pleased, but I took a picture of him, posed for me for a second, and that was the very first time I saw him. And then when I saw him as the giant a year later on TV, I was like, oh my God, that's the guy from Dennis's he convention. Had, he had no idea what he was getting into, right? And and Dennis Corlusa, for the folks who haven't heard the story, Dennis was running a convention in what what town in New Jersey? Cherry Hill. Cherry Hill. And I've got a table there, and I'm signing autographs and everything. And Larry Sharp came in because Dennis Corluzzo had been um, partners with Larry Sharp in the Monster Factory. The, the WWA. We, yes. Um, Larry Sharp had one of the first wrestling schools, the Monster Factory. And then Dennis's WWA World Wrestling Alliance, they'd use some of Larry Sharp's trainees on the undercard, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway... Larry comes in that morning and says, I got a guy you got to see because I was, even though I was running Smoky Mountain at the time, I was still, I was working for Vince, right? Um, he said, I got a guy you can see, you, you got to see. I've just, I, he's had a couple of lessons. He has his first match next month, but he's seven feet tall. And he's this and that. I said, is he in town? Yeah. So we'll bring him. Let me see him. So he, he said, I'll have him here this afternoon. Come back later on. There's Larry and in walks fucking Paul White behind him and he blocked out the entire fucking doorway. And we shook hands, talked for a couple seconds. And I told him, I said, Larry, I said, his first match is next month. Yeah. Tape it, send it to me. I will hand it to Vince McMahon and he'll have a contract. Right? It's that simple. Okay. Well, what happened was Hulk Hogan found out about Paul White and he never had that first match. They snatched him, signed him up without him ever having a match, and took him to Atlanta and trained him in secret, which is why he was the shits for the first year or so, besides being a good athlete for that size, because he'd never actually worked in front of people. And that's also how we got Giant Singh. Because I was, I, afterwards, I was like, Larry, what the fuck? You told me he was mine. I was going to get credit for this one. I was going to go to be... So three years later, he finds another fucking seven foot giant and he called me on the phone. I said, all right, God damn it. Don't show him to anybody. Bring him to the office next Tuesday. And this one was seven foot six or whatever. And that's how we got poor Paulo Singh, the giant Singh. It, it was, he didn't work out as well as big show. Who's the giant Singh? Remember? Giant the Silva? Gi Silva, Silva, not okay. Singh, Silva. Sorry. Paulo Silva is his name. <clears throat> he was driving a truck in New Jersey, legitimate giant Silva driving a truck in New Jersey, and he didn't speak English. So when he came to the office, he brought his neighbor. I forget what his neighbor's name was, but his little <laughs> little woman that was his interpreter and was as nice as could be. But that was the way you spoke to him at first. He was the, the giant that didn't get away, but Big Show did. Now Tony Khan's got him. Maybe he'll get Silva, too. 